Sly. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to our um, weekly Monty Hart uh, lecture. Today we have a, a very particular treat for those interested in congestive heart failure. Uh, Dr. Julia Shin will speak to us about uh, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, uh, which is essential to uh, modern and contemporary heart failure management. Uh, just a few words about Julia. She's an associate professor of medicine here at uh, Montefiore Einstein and has been the director of our fellowship program uh, since its inception. I believe. Uh, Julia initially trained in cardiology at uh, Emory in Atlanta, then did a heart failure fellowship here. And then one really started, built the program uh, at the very beginning uh, with um, Simon Maybaum and uh, had it in fantastic shape when I arrived here uh, seven years ago. So uh, thank you, Julia, for all you do for us. Also your expertise in coronary angiograms for all our transplant patients. Uh, and of course, uh, exceptional expertise in cardiopulmonary excess testing. So thanks for doing this. Uh, why do we need it? Let's find out. Julia? Great. Thank you, Uli. So <clears throat> um, like Dr. Yuri said, I will be um, talking about cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Um, this is a test that we do um, in the heart failure group on a fairly, fairly regular basis. Um, and uh, I do feel that um, it should be done um, probably more routinely in the general cardiology population. So um, to begin, um, I have no disclosures. So let's start with the case study. You are following a 65 year old woman um, who has a non ischemic cardiomyopathy. She's on optimal guideline directed heart failure medical therapy for about a year. And then she starts to describe gradually worsening shortness of breath. Um, you repeat an echo and her LVE of her left ventricular ejection fraction is 30%, which happens to be unchanged. So what could be causing her dyspnea? Um, it could be worsening heart failure. Maybe her ejection fraction has dropped. Uh, maybe she's developed some worsening mitral regurgitation and you'd get an echo um, for that. Maybe she's developed coronary disease, in which case you would order a stress test, um, maybe even a coronary angiogram. Um, maybe she's, she's a smoker, she's developed some lung disease um, and you should uh, you decide to chase that with the pulmonary function test. Maybe she has now pulmonary hypertension related to her left-sided heart failure, in which case you may do um, a right heart catheterization, or maybe she's just deconditioned, which would be a diagnosis of exclusion. So. You could either order all of these um, tests, um, some of which are invasive, but I would argue that you order one test, which would be the cardiopulmonary exercise test to try to figure out, um, is this heart failure, is this coronary disease, is this lung disease that's really causing the worsening of her symptomatology. So the objectives of this talk is to, um, one, describe the indications for cardiopulmonary exercise testing, or CPET, um, two is to explain metabolic parameters that are obtained during CPET. Um, three, to characterize normal and abnormal physiologic responses to exercise. And then four, to briefly describe um, a study that our group did here um, um, involving high intensity exercise training in LVAD patients. So first question is why do we do CPET? Um, it can objectively assess functional capacity and heart failure. And in addition to that, it can differentiate between different causes of exercise intolerance, be it uh, cardiac intolerance or pulmonary intolerance. Another reason to do this test is to assess response to therapy. Um, and then we can also use it as a perioperative evaluation um, for impairment and disability evaluation, um, or to determine exercise capacity before we enroll a patient in a formal exercise program. So the American Cardio College of Cardiology and the um, American Heart Association provide us guidelines for exercise testing with ventilatory gas analysis, which is a CPET. Um, and they say a class one indication is to evaluate exercise capacity and response to therapy in patients with heart failure who are being considered for heart transplantation. 
Um, and also a class one indication is assistance in the differentiation of cardiac versus pulmonary limitation as a cause of exercise induced dyspnea or when um, impaired exercise capacity cause is uncertain. A two-way reason to order this test would be evaluation of exercise capacity when indicated for medical reasons in patients in whom the estimates of exercise capacity um, from an exercise test time or work rate are unreliable. A 2B indication is evaluating a patient's response to specific therapeutic interventions when um, the improvement in exercise is an important uh, goal or endpoint. And also to determine the intensity for exercise training as part of a comprehensive cardiac rehabilitation program. A class three indication, meaning it's not indicated, is as routine use to assess exercise capacity. So um, why, why is exercise capacity important? Why um, should we be using this test to assess exercise capacity? Um, it has been consistently shown that exercise capacity is one of the most powerful predictors of life expectancy. This is across the spectrum of um, diseases. And what cardiopulmonary exercise testing does, it provides a non-invasive global assessment um, of really integrated exercise responses that involve multiple systems. Um, this is cardiovascular system, pulmonary system, and the skeletal muscle system, uh, which are not adequately reflected when you just measure each um, system um, in and of itself, uh, in, not in relation to the other ones. So this is... Um, a Wasserman diagram. Um, it's uh, Wasserman is a pulmonologist at UCLA Harbor who's really considered the, the father of, of cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And what this diagram shows is really how integrated this process is um, in assessing peak exercise capacity or peak oxygen consumption. So starting on the right of this screen here, where my cursor is, um, if our endpoint is measuring your peak oxygen consumption, um, it, this will um, clearly um, depend on what the oxygen tension of the atmosphere is. So if you were exercising on the top of um, Mount Kilimanjaro, for example, your peak VO2 um, would be less than if you were exercising at sea level because of the oxygen tension in the atmosphere. Um, the um, oxygen or the air gets inspired and expired in the lung then the lung um, exchanges um, into the pulmonary circulation, both um, oxygen and carbon dioxide. Um, the next step is the, is the heart, right? That either delivers blood to the periphery or um, delivers um, deoxygenated blood back to the lungs. Um, perfer um, peripheral um, circulation um, then is used to deliver the blood to the exercising muscle. And on the muscular level, you have um, various processes that go on to process the oxygen in the blood, um, including mitochondria, um, skeletal muscle, capillary density um, in the muscles. So you can see at any point here, uh, something can happen that decreases your peak oxygen consumption. Um, what the lungs do uh, when you start exercising is um, that increases tidal volume and minute ventilation. Uh, the pulmonary circulation recruits vessels to deliver that extra um, cardiac output um, to the heart. The heart increases cardiac output by increasing stroke volume and heart rate. Peripheral vasculature then vasodilates to deliver that extra blood to the periphery. And um, then the, blood, the muscles work to extract um, that oxygen and deliver um, carbon dioxide um, back, to the, back to the lungs. If you um, then want to sort of break that down um, as to where the specific pathologies may be. Um, well, in the lungs, you can have either obstructive disease or restrictive disease, infiltrative disease. At the pulmonary vasculature level, things like pulmonary hypertension, um, vasculitis, or pulmonary emboli uh, can decrease the peak oxygen consumption. The heart level is what we are um, probably most um, innately um, familiar with. So heart disease such as uh, ischemic uh, coronary disease, um, heart failure, 
uh, would impair your peak oxygen consumption. Uh, the periphery becomes important um, when you have things like peripheral arterial disease, um, you can have severe hypertension that impairs delivery to the muscles, or you can have something called vasoregulatory asthenia, which basically means that the um, peripheral vasculature cannot vasodilate or recruit in response to increased cardiac output. On the muscular level, if you have uh, mitochondrial problems, um, or um, severe obesity, um, you can impair oxygen consumption there. So oxygen consumption, um, you know, when we, when we talk about, let me put it this way, if we talk about cardiac output and you're calculating cardiac output by the Fick equation, um, then we, um, we put the oxygen consumption in the numerator and the ABO2 difference in the denominator. So if you rearrange that equation, then the oxygen consumption becomes the cardiac output multiplied by the ABO2 difference. And if you put um, the equation this way, you can see that your peak oxygen consumption can then become impaired um, at any of these um, four parameters. So heart rate can, um, your heart rate response can be attenuated if you have sinus node dysfunction or you're on beta blockers. Stroke volume response um, can be uh, worsened by heart failure, valvular disease, or ischemia. Um, the arterial tension in your blood um, can be decreased by either high altitude, or if you have pulmonary disease, or if you have anemia. Uh, so you have to remember that hemoglobin is required to carry oxygen to the cells. So if you have a low um, oxygen carrying capacity of your blood, i.e. anemia, that could decrease your peak oxygen consumption. And then on the um, venous um, level, your ability to extract oxygen is dependent upon capillary density in the muscle. Um, if you have things like skeletal mus muscular dystrophy or mitochondrial uh, dysfunction, um, these things can impair um, the ability of the muscles to extract oxygen. So this is um, a gentleman on a bicycle. Uh, we can do these cardiopulmonary exercise tests either uh, via treadmill testing or bicycle testing. Um, but what this is here to show you is um, really the plethora of information that we can get from this one test. So these are the things that we measure, um, starting with symptomatic scale. So we go by um, a Borg scale to try to um, guesstimate how the patient is feeling symptomatically. You have a blood pressure cuff to measure blood pressure response. If you're doing um, arterial sampling, which we don't do routinely, but we could do um, probably as part of a, a research protocol, then you would get your um, ABG information, such as a uh, lactate level, um, the um, PaO2, PaCO2. Um, we um, have a pulse oximeter on the finger to, to guesstimate um, what the, the arterial tension of um, oxygen is. So we have a continuous pulse oximeter. Um, we always ask what the reason for stopping is, be it dyspnea, be it leg pain, claudication, chest pain. And then on a ventilatory level, we measure tidal volume, respiratory rate, minute ventilation. We measure um, how much carbon dioxide is exhaled, and we measure how much oxygen is consumed. And if, when we put these parameters together, we get the ventilatory equivalents of your VCO2, ventilatory equivalents of your VO2, and then you have um, cardiac parameters where um, by we have continuous ECG monitoring, so we can monitor their heart rate response. We can look for um, ST deviations when we are worried about ischemia. Um, and uh, with the... Um, cycle ergometer or with the treadmill, we can figure out what the work rate is um, and calculate what the O2 versus work rate ratio is. Um, and I'll go over these parameters um, in a little bit more detail to make it clearer. So these are um, the important metabolic parameters that we obtain during CPET testing. Um, the primary um, goal is to see what the peak or maximal oxygen consumption is. And um, when you go by percent predicted, um, a normal person should reach greater than 85% predicted of your peak VO2. The 
ventilatory anaerobic threshold, or also known as the ventilatory threshold, also known as the anaerobic threshold, is the highest oxygen consumption um, that you obtain without a sustained increase in your blood lactate. I mean, this is normally reached at about 60%, 60 of your predicted peak VO2. So um, let's delve a little bit more um, into the anaerobic threshold. What happens during aerobic metabolism is that your minute ventilation increases linearly with your oxygen consumption. Once you reach your um, anaerobic threshold, um, which is when the muscles require more oxygen than it is being supplied, then um, the muscles uh, produce lactic acid. And um, when um, lactic acid is produced, uh, this gets buffered by sodium bicarbonate, which produces CO2. So what you see is this excess CO2 um, versus the O2, um, and this is the anaerobic threshold. So the anaerobic threshold is the oxygen consumption um, at the onset of lactic um, acid accumulation. And what happens when you produce this excess CO2 by buffering the lactic acid is your minute ventilation goes up more steeply. So you get a subjective sensation of worsening dyspnea or um, increasing respiratory rate. And you can visually identify it on a CPET as a disproportionate rise in your VCO2 or your minute ventilation in relation to your um, oxygen consumption. So this is the V-slope method that we use to try to figure out where the anaerobic threshold is. You have your um, carbon, di carbon dioxide production on um, the y-axis and your oxygen consumption on the x-axis. And as the VO2 and VCO2 um, are one-to-one -one here, when you're in aerobic metabolism, once you reach your anaerobic metabolism, the VCO2 rises disproportionately to the VO2. And this point, at which you get that inflection is what we call the anaerobic threshold. So the, the oxygen consumption or the VO2 at the point of this inflection is your anaerobic threshold. And you should be achieving that at about 60% of your predicted peak VO2. So um, now that we've established what the anaerobic threshold is, let's talk a little bit about the respiratory exchange ratio. What the RER is, is it's the ratio of the VCO2 to the VO2. And as you saw um, in this um, the diagram previously, um, it should be greater than one when your anaerobic threshold is achieved. And um, this is important in CPET testing because this is how we know that the patient has achieved their anaerobic threshold and that they've proceeded to exercise past it. Um, and this would be um, then a, a marker of, of how we assess whether it's a maximal test or not. So if you go back to this V-slope method um, of the anaerobic threshold, um, um, you can see that here the RER would, would be one to one. And then as the VCO2 rises disproportionately to the VO2, the RER exceeds one. And what we typically say is that an RER greater than 1.05 is what we consider a, a maximal test um, in that the patient had achieved anaerobic threshold and then proceeded to exercise beyond it until they had true um, limited termination of exercise. Um, the next parameter I wanna discuss is the O2 pulse. And what this is, is um, at any given point, uh, your oxygen consumption divided by the heart rate. And um, it is technically the amount of oxygen that's consumed from volume of blood delivered to tissues by each heartbeat. So what that then becomes is a surrogate for stroke volume. And um, our normal stroke volume or peak stroke volume um, should be greater than 80% predicted. If this is less than what we predict, um, then it's an indication that you have some uh, limitation of stroke volume response to exercise, which happens with heart failure. This is looking at O2 pulse in different subjects. So you see in panel one, this is a healthy volunteer um, and the O2 pulse, which remember is a surrogate for stroke volume, increases steadily with work rate. The red is the heart rate, the um, blue is the um, O2 pulse or the oxygen consumption over heart rate. If you look at panel B, this is a patient who has myocardial ischemia. So as one, um, as this person exercises, 
their heart rate goes up, their um, O2 pulse or their stroke volume goes up, but the peak is attenuated here because once they develop myocardial ischemia, um, their ability to increase that stroke volume diminishes. And then panel C um, is a typical response of a heart failure patient in which um, as one, as he or she works or exercises, the stroke volume response is clearly attenuated um, compared to the normal individual. You see a very early fat flattening of the O2 pulse, um, which is a surrogate for the early stroke volume um, flattening that, you, that one gets with exercise if you have heart failure. Um, so a couple more um, parameters that I think are worth discussing um, as important in patients with heart failure are the VE over VCO2, which is your minute ventilation over your carbon dioxide production. Um, this is also called the ventilatory equivalent of CO2. Uh, and basically this reflects ventilatory efficiency uh, with the normal being greater than um, less than 34. Um, breathing reserve which is your minute ventilation over your maximal voluntary ventilation is a ratio um, you know, that should be greater than um, 30% when you finish exercising. So another way to say that is uh, a normal individual should have a healthy breathing reserve left at the end of exercise, uh, meaning that our lungs are really not what limit um, a normal person um, from, from stopping exercise. It's really the cardiovascular system um, that should be the limitation. If the breathing reserve is very low, then that indicates that there may be some pulmonary disease um, that limits peak um, exercise capacity. And then if you have an arterial line, which again, we don't do routinely, um, but if we did have an A line, we can sample arterial blood um, at specified intervals and measure lactate, um, the um, uh, arterial pressure um, of O2 and CO2, and then the gradients um, and pH. So a normal response to exercise is that your um, oxygen consumption increases linearly up until you reach your peak VO2, and then it plateaus off. The heart, heart rate response is also linear until you reach your maximal predicted heart rate, which is around 220 minus your age, and then it plateaus. The stroke volume response is curvilinear. So your stroke volume when you initiate exercise increases early, and then it plateaus um, and changes little. Your AVO2 difference widens as the myxomenous oxygen content falls. Um, since uh, in normal subjects, your arterial oxygen um, content should not change. Um, so the AVO2 difference widens um, by um, decreasing the mixed venous O2 content. In heart failure patients, there are several um, typical abnormal responses to exercise. Heart failure patients um, will have a reduced peak oxygen consumption, and the major factors that limit peak VO2 in heart failure are this decreased stroke volume, volume response um, because their hearts are dilated and their ejection fractions are low. Um, and in addition to that, they typically have peripheral vascular dysfunction. So they are unable to recruit the peripheral vasculature to deliver that um, oxygen to the exercising muscle. Heart failure patients also have a low um, anaerobic threshold, which represents an early onset of metabolic acidosis. Um, they also um, typically have higher heart rate responses at submaximal levels of, VO, of uh, VO2. Um, and you can understand this because if their stroke volume response is limited, then the only way that the heart can increase cardiac output is by increasing the heart rate. And then there's abnormal heart rate recovery that is seen um, that probably has to do with this chronic sympathetic stimulation that uh, heart failure patients have. Heart failure patients will also have a high um, ventilatory equivalent of VCO2. Um, they have a high minute ventilation um, uh, versus the, the carbon dioxide production. And what this represents is this early um, and severe onset of metabolic acidosis. Um, there's also abnormal ventilation ventilation perfusion relationships in severe heart failure because um, the, the heart um, being unable to, to adequately increase cardiac output 
again, is not perfusing ventilated segments of the lung. So it basically represents dead space ventilation. Um, and then you can also get subclinical pulmonary edema um, if you have bad heart failure, uh, which can increase your minute um, ventilation over your VCO2. Heart failure patients also typically um, in late stages of disease have this, uh, what we call an oscillary ventilation. It's, um, you know, the best way I can describe it is that it's, it's kind of like a Shane Stoke um, pattern where they hyperventilate and they hypoventilate and you kind of see this oscillation um, in their ventilatory pattern on the, um, the CPAP machine. As discussed, heart failure patients will also have a low O2 pulse because they're unable to augment fully stroke volume uh, to exercise. And one key thing um, that you should know is that heart failure patients will typically not desaturate. So their pulse oximeter should stay normal um, throughout the course of exercise, unless they have concomitant pulmonary disease. Um, and this is important. So if you desaturate, um, it means that um, you either have um, interstitial lung disease um, or you have pulmonary hypertension. And if you just have systolic heart failure, you should not desaturate when you exercise. Um, and really the reason behind that is that um, as long as you're perfusing as long as you are ventilating perfused segments. So let's say your cardiac output is very low and your ability to increase this cardiac output is attenuated in heart failure. As long as your lungs are capable of ventilating those perfused, seg perfused segments, um, you should still maintain your, the oxygen tension in your blood because the lungs are just very good at extracting that oxygen. So, um, you know, conversely, if you have pulmonary disease and you are unable to ventilate those perfused segments, then you would notice um, that the oxygen um, saturation will decrease. So other factors that contribute to exercise intolerance and in heart failure patients are a reduced inotropic and chronotropic response to catecholamines. And this occurs partly because um, heart failure patients down, down regulate their beta receptors because they're just chronically stimulated by catecholamines. Uh, stroke volume can um, be attenuated um, by diastolic dysfunction or um, a pericardial constraint if you have a very large dilated heart. And then um, the onset of pulmonary hypertension and increased pulmonary vascular resistance with exercise can also reduce your cardiac output by impairing uh, right ventricular um, uh, output, essentially. Heart failure patients can also have worsening mitral regurgitation. Uh, peripheral dysfunction is very common. This is uh, caused by endothelial dysfunction and a limited vasodilatory capacity in those with chronic heart failure. And then abnormalities in skeletal muscle are also often present, and this limits uh, muscle um, metabolic capacity with ex exercise. So, um, you, you guys probably know that for our, our heart failure patients, we use this peak VO2 uh, to guide listing for transplantation. And this is the trial by Donna Mancini um, that really uh, was a seminal study um, by which we decided to use this number of 14 to list um, patients for transplant. So what she did was she took 100, 116 heart failure patients and divided them into three groups. The first uh, with the peak VO2 of less than 14 milliliters per tig per minute um, that were accepted for transplantation. The second group had a peak VO2 of greater than 14 that were considered too well for transplantation. And then the third group had a peak VO2 of less than 14, but were excluded for transplantation for other reasons. Um, they weren't considered candidates. And what she found was that uh, the one year um, survival rates were um, in the 40s if your peak VO2 was less than 14, and 94% of your peak VO2 was greater than 14. Um, so based on this study, we use a peak VO2 of 14 to guide um, our listing for transplant. Um, she noted that a peak VO2 of less than 10 had significantly poorer predictive survival. This is the Weber classification. Um, so we stratify uh, patients in severity of disease by Weber class A through E, um, with A being none to mild and E being very severe. 
And this is stratified by both peak VO2 and, and your anaerobic threshold. So um, if your peak VO2 is normal and your anaerobic threshold is normal, um, then you're in Weber, Weber class B. And then as you progress down the severity scale, um, you become Weber class E where your peak VO2 is very low and your anaerobic threshold is very low. And the Weber classification also predicts survival in heart failure patients. You see that um, Weber class A patients here um, have a significantly greater survival than those with B, C, and D classes. There are other predictors of mortality that you can get from this test. Um, the one, one of them is the VE over VCO2 slope. Um, and there are studies that suggest that this slope may actually be a better predictor of mortality than your peak VO2. Um, and like I've described, the VBCO2 um, describes enhanced ventilatory response to exercise. Um, so it's, it's just a marker of decreased ventilatory efficiency. Um, when you have increased minute ventilation and heart failure, this increases dead space ventilation. And this increase in BCO2 relative to your VO2 um, occurs because of early uh, onset of anaerobic thresholds. Um, there's one study that showed if your peak VO2 is greater than 18, your three-year survival was lower with um, if your BCO2 was greater than 34. 57% three-year survival versus 93% three-year survival. Um, so if you look here and uh, looking at peak VO2 and your VEVCO2 uh, predicting survival in heart failure, you see uh, here's your survival curve if both are normal. Here's your survival curve if your peak VO2 is greater than less than 14. This is your survival curve if your VE over VCO2 is greater than 44.7. And then if both are abnormal, um, this portends the, the most dismal um, survival. Um, anaerobic threshold is also something that predicts uh, mortality and heart failure. Uh, anaerobic threshold is less prone to error um, when you're measuring uh, these parameters with this test. And in one study, it showed that if your anaerobic threshold was less than 11, that's, that was more predictive of six month mortality um, than having a peak VO2 of less than 14. Other points to consider is that your peak VO2 naturally declines with age and is naturally lower in women. For obese patients, you need to adjust the predicted peak VO2 to ideal body weight. So um, if you have a predicted peak VO2, which is uh, calculated in part by weight, um, and you use their actual body weight for an obese patient, then your predicted peak VO2 is much higher than it would be if you used her ideal body weight to calculate the predicted. Um, the other point is that in the beta blocker era, we actually use a lower cutoff peak VO2 to list for transplants. The reason for that is that we know um, through numerous studies that beta blockers improve survival in heart failure patients, but for whatever reason, um, it doesn't increase your peak VO2. So we use a cutoff of 12 um, for patients who are on beta blockers to list. Um, and it's also been shown over and over that peak VO2 also predicts mortality in patients with um, preserved ejection fraction, not just systolic heart failure. So the um, International Society of Heart Lung Transplantation has these recommendations for CPET to guide transplant listing. Class one recommendation is that a maximal CPET is defined when your respiratory exchange ratio is greater than 1.05 which means that you have achieved um, anaerobic threshold um, on patient, in patients who are on optimal pharmacologic therapy. In patients who are beta blocker intolerant, they suggest to use a cutoff of uh, 14 to guide listing. If the patient is on a beta blocker, then you use a cutoff of peak VO2 of less than 12 to guide transplant listing. In um, class 2A, in young patients less than 50 and in women, it's reasonable to consider using alternate standards in conjunction with peak VO2 to guide listing, including percent predicted. So we, um, you know, in, in either very young individuals or in small women, we will use um, this predicted um, peak VO2 of less than 50% uh, to guide transplant listing. 
Uh, 2B indication is in the presence of a submaximal CPEP, so when you're not quite sure that the patient has reached anaerobic threshold or the RAR is greater than 1.05, you can use the VE over VCO2 sub greater than 35 as one of the determinants in listing for transplant. Um, in obese patients with a BMI greater than 30, um, one should consider adjusting the PCO2 to lean body mass. And then class three is that you don't list patients for transplant just based on VO2 measurement alone. So um, this is kind of an algorithm um, by which um, I interpret these tests. So the, the main thing is that you look and see what the peak VO2 is. If the peak VO2 is normal, um, which is greater than 85% predicted, um, and the patient is complaining of dyspnea, then at the differential diagnosis here is either anxiety, um, obesity, or mild disease that we have not been able to pick up yet. If your peak VO2 is low, then the next step is to look at the anaerobic threshold. If the anaerobic threshold is normal, then you look at the breathing reserve. If the breathing reserve is low, then the patient has lung disease. So remember, um, a normal individual is not limited by your lungs. You're really um, limited by the cardiovascular system. If the breathing, breathing reserve is normal, um, then the patient uh, may just have given a, a poor effort um, or may be deconditioned. Going down this route, so your peak VO2 is low, your anaer anaerobic threshold, threshold is low. If the breathing reserve is normal, then the patient likely has a circulatory impairment um, that, that uh, explains their low peak VO2. If the breathing reserve is low, um, then the patient likely has mixed lesions. So probably a combination of pulmonary disease and cardiovascular disease to explain their exercise limitation. This is the nine panel plot um, that we get for each exercise test. And it really um, is a wealth of information that you get from one um, non-invasive test. And what you see here, um, it's, it's very busy, but what you see here is your um, peak VO2 in red. So the dotted red line here is your predicted peak VO2. So I know just by looking at this graph here that the patient did not reach their predicted peak VO2. Um, this plot eight is where we look at the respiratory exchange ratio. So here is that, um, value of one, you want to make sure that the patient reaches their anaerobic threshold and then exercises beyond it. So you clearly see here that the patient has exercised beyond their anaerobic threshold, and this is what we consider an, an optimal test. Um, the other things you can see here are your heart rate response. So in plot two, you see your heart rate response in um, brown. This is your predicted peak heart, heart rate. Um, and the patient reaches um, not quite up to the predicted peak. This is your O2 pulse response. So your VO2 over heart rate as you exercise. Um, if you remember, this is a circuit for your stroke volume and stroke volume should increase early, curvilinearly and then plateau. Here's a minute ventilation response. Um, and um, these are the, the plots one, four and seven are your ventilatory parameters. Um, and what else can I tell you? So there's also a pulse oximeter. Um, it's missing the green line here, but you can see um, typically what their pulse ox does throughout the course of exercise. So here are um, some typical CPAP patterns. Um, in heart failure, you have low anaerobic threshold, you have normal breathing reserve, low O2 pulse, um, which is a circuit for stroke volume, low heart rate reserve, um, high VE, VCO2 slope, and then normal oxygen saturation. In lung disease, you have low breathing reserve. Um, you have a normal O2 pulse uh, because your heart really shouldn't, your stroke volume response really shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be limited. And your anaerobic threshold, unless you have severe lung disease, should be normal. You have high heart rate reserve uh, because that now your heart is not what is limiting your peak exercise, it's your lungs. You do desaturate because of dead space, um, VQ mismatches, and a patient with severe lung disease will have higher bore ratings for um, dyspnea. Uh, 
If the patient has anxiety or um, supratemporal dyspnea, um, then you, you have high breathing and heart rate reserves because now these are not the systems that are limiting your peak exercise. Um, you can have an irregular breathing pattern um, just from the, the anxiety hyperventilation. Um, high VEBCO2 because of hyperventilation, um, subjectively high rate ratings for breathlessness, and they typically don't reach or they have a normal ventilatory threshold. So let me make a little shift here. Um, this is uh, the Montefiore high intensity um, exercise training that we um, did in LVAD patients. So this was led by Miguel um, Alvarez, who was a fellow uh, with us and is now an attending at Jacoby, um, and also by one of my partners, um, Dr. Snail Patel. And what they looked at was um, uh, exercise training in LVAD patients. Um, what we have noted is that after LVAD implantation, patients often have persistent exercise limitation. And um, Miguel and Snail um, sought to, to discover if high intensity interval training um, would improve aerobic cap capacity um, in LVAD patients, um, because HIT training has been shown um, in studies to improve exercise capacity in normal individuals when you compare it to uh, moderate continuous training. So um, in the end, um, 59 patients were screened, but 15 patients were enrolled. Um, these patients had either HeartMate 2 or HeartMate 3 LVADs, um, and they were enrolled in a 15 session, five week high intensity interval training program. Um, the um, things looked at were a turn down echocardiogram, turn down meaning that um, the LVAD speed was turned down to the point where it equaled net zero. Um, so essentially unsupported uh, left ventricle. Um, the KCCQ questionnaire um, and CPET performed uh, before and after the exercise training program. So um, the patients had a baseline uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test to guide training intensity. Um, the peak um, VO2 that they obtained was then used to determine what their high intensity interval should be. So um, they embarked on this training program, uh, 15 sessions on a bicycle, where um, they performed um, six, six intervals of high intensity training based on the peak work rate obtained at the baseline CPET. And then after five weeks, 90% um, completed the protocol. And what they found was that um, there was a 20% increase in the anaerobic threshold um, on, their, um, end, on their end of study CPET and a 5% decrease in the left ventricular end diastolic volume on their turn down echocardiogram. So looking at the data here, the peak VO2 um, doesn't uh, really change um, before and after the intensity, intense exercise program, but you can see that the onset of anaerobic threshold is delayed. So their peak VO2 at the anaerobic threshold is higher in those who had complete, um, completed the HIT program versus um, those um, who didn't. So what does this mean? Um, well, an increase in your anaerobic threshold is actually a very good um, marker for improvement in um, exercise capacity. And perhaps if these patients continued to do this um, training for longer than 15 weeks, we may have seen um, a, a demonstrated an increase in the peak VO2. But I do feel that um, finding this um, increase in anaerobic threshold is actually a, um, an important finding. So the conclusions of the study were that improvements were seen in both um, ventilatory threshold or anaerobic threshold and in left ventricular and diastolic volume. There was no change in maximal oxygen consumption or the KCCQ score, uh, but HIT training was safe and well tolerated in patients with chronic LVAD support. So to conclude, let's go back to this case study. So you had a 65-year-old woman. Um, she was on optimal guideline-directed heart failure meds. Um, and then she describes this gradually worsening dyspnea. You get an echo. Um, her EF is unchanged. So, you know, what would you do next? Um, would you refer immediately for implantation of the left ventricular assist device? Would you list for transplantation? Would you tell her EF has not declined, so she shouldn't be feeling worse? I would say no to all of these. You would obtain a cardiopulmonary exercise test with the question being, what is the cause of her worsening dyspnea? So you put her on the treadmill 
Her peak VO2 is 18, which is less than what it had been a year ago. She's noted to have a low breathing reserve and a high heart rate reserve. So now you know here that her limitation is probably the lung. So the patient desaturates, she has a normal O2 pulse or stroke volume response. Um, you diagnose a pulmonary limitation to exercise. She gets um, sent for a complete cardiopulmonary, um, sorry, pulmonary function test. And she ultimately gets diagnosed with uh, COPD and starts to feel better with treatment. So to answer my initial question, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, why do we need it? Exercise capacity is one of the most powerful predictors of life expectancy. And this um, test is a very, a, a very good objective measurement of exercise capacity. Your peak VO2 predicts mortality in heart failure patients and guides the timing of heart transplant or LVAD implantation. This test is very helpful to differentiate between cardiac, pulmonary, or peripheral causes of exercise limitation. So you get one non-invasive comprehensive test versus um, several um, disjointed tests um, that may be invasive. Um, CPET is non-invasive, it's informative, and really should be considered before the other um, more extensive invasive tests are done. And that is my talk. So thank you. This is my, our, our group, a very handsome group, I must say. Great, Julia, thank you very much. This, this was uh, really terrific. We shall uh, freeze this picture in time as we have done already for three years. I think it reflects well on us <laughs> in retrospect. So let's see. Um, I don't yet see any questions in the uh, chat. Oh, there's one question in the chat. Yeah, so a question from Anita Goyal, thank you. Um, can you comment on the reliability, repro reproducibility of CPAT? Um, can I comment on it? I don't have specific um, data to show you, um, but I can tell you that this is um, this is a reliable reproducible test. I mean, we um, we depend on this um, to to guide listing for transplant, um, which is a pretty significant intervention, you know, to be done. But. Yeah, let me follow up on that question and, and ask you, uh, I agree entirely that there's very high repro reproducibility and reliability. And so then my follow-up question is, why shouldn't, why are not more people doing it? Should the doctors do it in their, in their private office? Uh, should we do it everywhere? How difficult is it to get? Yeah, that's, um, that's a good question. I think, um, I think the number one reason why we don't do it more often is that people just really aren't aware that this is a test they can order, right? So um, at least in the general cardiology training programs that I've seen, um, it's just not a very visible test, right? Because um, just select groups will do it. I'm not sure if this should be done everywhere. I think um, interpreting the test um, is probably not, um, you know, it, it's, it's complicated and, it, you know, you need, I think the re reliability and reproducibility of interpretation is something that can be questioned, right? So um, I think it should be done at um, expertise centers. Um, I think it should be taught more in the cardio general cardiology curriculum. Yeah, I agree with that. And I just wanna to add to that, that it is uh, executing the test actually is quite difficult where the device has to be calibrated by somebody who really knows what they're doing and then you get really good results. Uh, it's extremely difficult to maintain a uh, good quality testing facility with low volume, almost impossible to drag out the machine every time. So I agree with Julia, this should only be done by uh, experienced centers who do enough tests every week to have a technician dedicated to this and execute it. So Jonathan Bradlow, uh, Ask my favorite question, uh, should we be sending suspected HFPEF patients for CPAT when they have dyspnea on exertion and the normal echo and stress testing? Um, I think, um, well, the basic answer is yes. I think anybody who has unexplained dyspnea should be sent for this test. Um, it may be HFPEF, um, it may be undiagnosed lung disease, uh, I think that um, 
um, you know, this is a very good test to try to differentiate between the various causes of dyspnea. Yeah, excellent. And Sneha Patel actually comes in with a somewhat related question, but I think it explains it also well. Uh, statement, many patients have unexplained dyspnea after standard cardiac care and pulmonary workup. Would CPAT have a role for this, i.e. a dyspnea clinic? Um, yes, again, uh, you know, my, my stand, I think my, my bottom line answer is that anybody who has unexplained dyspnea, um, should get this test. Yes. Um, yeah, we can unco uncover pulmonary disease, lung disease. Um, I have to say that the, the COVID, the COVID clinic has been sending patients to us, you know, this, these so-called long haul COVID symptom patients. Um, to try to see if they have any lasting pulmonary or cardiac, um, you know, implications to COVID. Yeah, very yeah. good. I totally agree with that. Um, I mean, another thing that, you know, I, I, I like to really look at whether or not the patient has a, a chronotropic incompetence, right? And you mentioned uh, in your case, the patient, this patient had a normal heart rate reserve which is also something with cardiopulmonary exercise testing, if without this metabolic card, you know, we don't really know, uh, and you mentioned this, is this a full effort or not, right? But now we really know that even with a full effort, the heart rate doesn't go up and there are things we can do about that with pacing. Um, okay, very good. Um, I don't see uh, any other questions uh, in the chat, but I think the key questions were asked and, and really I like the Jonathan's question. I like Sneha's comment about the Disney clinic. And uh, Julia, I just wanna thank you. You really broke this. This is a highly complex topic. I've struggled with it for decades. That's why I don't give this lecture, but you really did a great job um, breaking this down, making it really understandable and relating it to the clinical context. So thank you very much. Um, I think we're done here. This is the slide for um, the next lecture on October 1, where Didi Wang from Henry Ford will talk to us about uh, 3D printing uh, and computational models and AI for structural heart disease. So thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Thanks, Julia. And we'll see you uh, next week with some artificial intelligence.